Janine Quorm. I am a 2015 Aspen Institute Scholar. I am also a research analyst to the director of the strategy unit at the International Monetary Fund. I'm delighted to introduce this next session, Special Operators and Intelligence Analysts, the 21st Century's Lead Warriors. Huge ground invasions and indefinite occupation forces are so last decade. Today's wars, big and small, are being fought largely by the strategic deployment of limited special operators and the ground and intelligence analysts back stateside who dispatch them and drones to the world's hotspots for quick in and out operations. Experts in this kind of the 21st century warfare will discuss the strengths and weaknesses of this approach to global crisis. Moderating this session is Kim Dozier. Kim joined the Daily Beast and CNN as a contributing writer, on-air analyst in 2014. After four years as AP's intelligence writer with trips to Afghanistan and Pakistan and 17 years as an award-winning CBS News foreign and national security correspondent. She authored Breathing the Fire about a car bomb that hit her CBS News team in Iraq in 2006. She's now researching stories of resilience in the special operations and intelligence world. And with that, the floor is, is all yours, Kim. Take it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Clark and the Forum for having us here and sponsoring this discussion. And also want to thank uh, Admiral Eric Olson for stepping into the breach when we asked him this morning uh, because uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense Michael Lumpkin was stymied by the airlines and only got as far as Denver last night, so couldn't join us today. Uh, we also have with us um, Dr. Mike Vickers, former Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and also uh, former head of special operations within the Pentagon. And Kathleen Hicks, who has held many senior roles inside the Pentagon and is now at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So, I want to open with a question that has touched on all of your careers. You've all spent time fighting extremist militants in your different roles. With that experience, looking at the Islamic State group and Al-Qaeda, is ISIS or ISIL the threat that the national security community is making it out to be to the US public? Um, and is Al-Qaeda on the back foot for good, or is it just prepping for the next battle? You may begin. Um, <laughs> oh, and, oh. Uh, mines um, every day. Um, ISIL, in a way, is a bigger threat because of its ability to inspire uh, so-called lone wolf or uh, radicalization attacks uh, across the world. But Al-Qaeda is, is more sophisticated. So if an airliner blew up over the United States, it would far more likely be Al-Qaeda uh, today than, uh, than ISIL. Uh, and that remains a, a significant danger. Um, Al-Qaeda has suffered a lot of losses, um, but it is still very much in the game. And, and as it has passed in its history, um, it, can, it can come back in various ways. I, I do think that the ISIL threat has been appropriately described. I, I don't think it's overblown. Um, I think it's a significant threat. And uh, as discussed in some of the previous panels, I think it was particularly with Jay Johnson, in part it's because of the fact that it's been, uh, there's an area, territorial um, region that's, that it's been uh, able to occupy and operate from. And of course, then there's the social network piece that allows it to operate worldwide. Al-Qaeda, I think, is not uh, permanently on its heels, but we can try to keep it there. It's, to the extent that Al-Qaeda has been significantly degraded, it's because of a lot of US and worldwide attention and investment to making it so, not least of all the two gentlemen to my left and right. Um, and I think that's what it takes going forward, whether it's ISIL, Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Shabaab, Al-Nusra, Al you name it. Um, it takes a concerted long-term effort to counter terrorism with all the tools that we have and in coalition. 
And Admiral Olson, with your former time heading Special Operations Command, did you expect we'd still be as a nation in the thick of this fight now, all these years later? Yeah, so, so first let me say it's great to be back in this forum. I thank Walter and Clark and others for making this possible. And I apologize for not being Mike Lumpkin, but it is, uh, it is good to get this band back together. And I'm very pleased to be on this stage with, the, with my two former colleagues. I'll also say that I spent most of my time in uniform avoiding Kim Dozier. <laughs> <laughs> But it wasn't for lack of respect for her tenacity or the quality of her work. But it's good to be with you today, Kim. Thank you. Uh, so I didn't hear, I left military service now almost four years ago. ISIL wasn't on our scope. Uh, it is a new phenomenon. And so um, I, I, can't, I can't talk about ISIL from my historical perspective as the commander of Special Operations Command. But I do agree with, with Mike and Kathleen that ISIL is a real threat. It's a real regional threat. The persecution and the violence are, are threatening and scary to, to many. Um, and it is a real threat to us. Um, but I think that we, when, when we speak of, of ISIL as kind of the, the next generation of Al Qaeda, uh, we, we undercredit them as an army. Um, Al Qaeda clearly a terrorist group, but ISIL is organized and behaving like an army with real military structure, with military equipment. They seize and hold territory in a way that, uh, that Al Qaeda couldn't do. And so I, I think that makes it not an apples to apples comparison between Al Qaeda and ISIL. And yet there are other threats out there. The asymmetric threat posed by Russia um, in places like Ukraine, um, Iran's support of Assad, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, Hezbollah, on and on, North Korea's nuclear threat. Are our national security efforts skewed by the fear of ISIS and al-Qaeda when they haven't caused nearly that much damage in this country recently as compared to some of these other actors and their effect overseas? You know, one of our collective former bosses, Leon Panetta, always liked to say we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And we have to, you know, even if we didn't think we could, we, we need to learn how to. Uh, I don't think we spend a, a disproportionate or unreasonable amount of time focused on CT and in particular on the ISIS threat or that that is taking away from our ability to focus on longer term challenges. Now, having said that, Resources are severely limited, and that's obviously money. Sequestration makes it much harder on top of already having, you know, you're always going to have challenges with money, people, um, and the tool set that we have. And again, this was talked a little bit in the last panel. The tool set that the United States has is essentially a Cold War tool set that we're trying to adapt as quickly as we can to the world we face. But it's very challenging to meet all of those uh, potential threats at once, and it's a constant prioritization of which tools in which region or situation to, you know, to what end. Um, and that leads you to sort of a selective engagement strategy that you see the United States having chosen for, for multiple administrations in many years. And it's usually dissatisfying to the public because it's hard to figure out sometimes why, in, why intercede there and not there, why choose to apply power and resources here but not there. So, so we are in a period of uh, unprecedented instability in the international system, and we are accruing national security uh, threats. The one that you didn't mention was the, the rise of China. You know, East Asia is the most, uh, is really probably the locus of future strategic and economic competition. We have three challenges to the world order right now, China and East Asia, Russia uh, and Europe, and Sunni jihadists and lots of others in the Middle East. And you have to be able to deal with them all, as, as Kathleen said. And also, the capabilities that you need to deter conflict with China, the, the long-term competition with China is fundamentally economic and technological, are not the same that you need for counterterrorism and, and stability uh, in the Middle East, and vice versa. Uh, and so you have to have a portfolio of capabilities and, and strategies to deal with the range of threats. I certainly have never seen such a wide range of, of threats from the very high end uh, uh, to the non-state actors in, in the 40 years I've been in this business. The thing is, do you have the tools you need to do the job? Do you have enough forces to do it? 
and are you getting a chance to do it on the ground? Um, for instance, what's being done in Ukraine to um, fight Russian influence there? I, I hear Pentagon officials talking about Russian interference, but I'm not hearing what U.S. Special Operations is doing about it. Uh, General Votel speaks quite openly, the head of Special Operations Command now, about Russia's asymmetric warfare there. What can, that they've put their troops inside Ukraine to direct um, rebel forces against the Ukrainian government. What is the U.S. doing or can it do in return? Uh, so General Votel will be here on Friday and I think that'd be a good question for <laughs> okay, him. Okay, got it. <laughs> Um, and as you pointed out, uh, we, at least I'm in the private sector, but the first word in private sector is private. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to, to go someplace I shouldn't go. But, but I, I will say that the, I mean, obviously it was a classic special operation in annexing Crimea. Uh, and, and, and they had gone to school on, on special operations uh, sort of concepts in, in executing that. Uh, but what specifically special operations forces might be doing is, is something that I won't talk about. I'll jump in. Okay. Um, we, it was no surprise that the Russians are really good at unconventional warfare. We have long known that that's something that they have continued to invest in and be good at. We've certainly seen them operate in Chechnya and elsewhere. The surprise, of course, is that they chose politically, if you will, that Putin made a leadership decision to do this invasion of Crimea. Definitely not something I would have foreseen. Um, so what is and can and should the US be doing about it? I think first and foremost, the US is rightly focused on NATO. And I do think special operations, it is a very good question to ask General Votel, is focused on working with its allies, particularly in the Baltics and Poland, but other allies from NATO in those states to shore up the ability of those states to withstand any kind of political pressure, um, masking, you know, military aggression masking as political pressure, if you will, or little green men-like approaches from, from Russia. Ukraine is obviously much harder. Back to the question I think that was asked about Moldova before. Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, these are not NATO territories. These are not covered by Article 5, and it's uh, much trickier. The US and NATO put forward a view that we would spend more time and attention on those partner states um, coming out of the Wales summit. I think that's important. I think it's important personally. I think it's important to provide defensive weapons from the United States to the Ukrainian forces. And some special operations training should be a part of that. Um, but, but by and large, our efforts should be focused really on making sure we can stick to that Article 5 commitment for the NATO states. Uh, it, but it, it, it sounds that's working by, with, and through another organization as opposed to more direct interference, the path that Russia has chosen. Well, Russia really is doing a form of hybrid warfare. Um, they do work through proxies where they can, and then where um, those proxies are on the verge of losing, then they'll intervene with conventional forces, as they have done in Ukraine for a brief period of time to restore the balance in their favor and then shift back to proxy war. But this form of proxy war is not just in Ukraine and the territories, the non-NATO territories around the former Soviet Union, um, but also that's in the Middle East as well. And like it or not, that's the conflict that we're in. Just let me add to what Kathleen said, that the special operations cooperation across the NATO countries it is un Precedented, that there is actually a command within the NATO structure. Uh, there is a special operations headquarters. There are people from across the NATO countries going to work every day. There are training, there is training classroom and field training that takes place every day and exercises that take place um, with a special operations flavor across NATO countries. So I, I, I do want to make sure that there's a recognition of the level of cooperation. So could, you be, the special operations so could you be forces. saying that while we don't see U.S. boots on the ground in terms of special forces teams training the locals, there might be European special forces teams doing the same things, helping bolster their efforts to fight back the Russian back troops? I'm not saying what they are doing, uh, but what I'm saying is that the coordination, the sharing of tactics, techniques, the interoperability of the equipment, the knowledge of each other's capabilities and limitations is, is at a very high level. 
But as you said, Kim, part of the challenge is both uh, in working with partners such as the Ukrainians, and I spent a lot of time there my last year in government, but um, is building robust institutions that can uh, protect themselves from a counterintelligence perspective against the, the Russians, uh, winning the battle of influence. I mean, one thing Putin has done here, he may have won in the short term, he has turned the Ukrainians into nationalists in a way no Ukrainian politician could have done. And, uh, you know, so the longer term, that's really the big fight. So, so to shift to the fight against the Islamic State group in Iraq and Syria, the U.S. has a choice. At this point, it's chosen to fight through a large coalition, largely hands off. Might there be a time coming when the U.S. has to step it up as Russia did and choose hybrid warfare? The kind that we saw in Afghanistan. You would have special forces with an Afghan team. The Afghan team would be allowed to do the fight until they started losing, and then the U.S. would step in. Okay, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I would just say, I think what we did in Afghanistan in 2001 uh, was remarkable in ejecting the Taliban regime and Al-Qaeda. But I wouldn't equate that in the same way as, uh, as what Putin has done in Ukraine. I would say that's the marriage of modern conventional precision warfare with unconventional warfare that works so phenomenally. But I guess what and I, you could apply that to Iraq and Syria, yes. But in Iraq and Syria, are US efforts as part of a coalition arresting the growth of ISIS fast enough? or? Do you need to ramp up the number of U.S. advisors on the ground, uh, joint air controllers forward, things that would make the Iraqi forces, the Kurdish forces, the U.S. proxies in the region more effective in the battlefield today? I would say I think, I think it is, uh, th there is room to grow, if you will, the U.S. contribution to include special operators on the train and advise side. There's no doubt about that. But, before you grow that out, there is an ab absorption, an absorptive capacity issue, which is the ground forces that are there to work with. That's where I think there's rightfully a lot of attention right now in trying to make sure that we can get, we collectively, the coalition can get the Iraqis, um, obviously their political situation, put a lot of pressure on the political situation to get forces in that are, you know, uh, Aligned to feel some sort of allegiance to the Baghdad government and then are capable of working with U.S. and other trainers. Um, where we have done that, obviously Kurdish forces would be the most obvious example where they have been pretty, um, pretty aggressive. Uh, that has worked very well in terms of the U.S. ability to bring in firepower, the U.S. ability to marry I, their, our ISR with their uh, on-the-ground capability, and then the training aspect. And, that, uh, and I will add, and I do think that has to be sustained. You can't do that lightly and limitedly and think that will take care of the situation with ISIL. I think it's a long-term issue. But before we jump in with a whole lot more, we need those ground forces to start to come together. Yet those ground forces can take years to grow. And in the interim, it seems that ISIS is growing faster and doing things like planning plots against the US homeland, or at least inspiring plots against the, the US homeland. So do we have the luxury of this time it's going to take to bring these forces up to speed? Mike? Well, so one model is you train forces. Uh, you may give them some uh, air and ISR support, but basically they're going to do the fighting. You're, you're a trainer. That obviously takes a lot longer uh, to get them ready than if you're willing to uh, advise and assist to actually go with them on the front lines. When you combine air power with a ground force, you referenced Afghanistan in 2001. Well, I meant Afghanistan even now. Well, no, but I'm Afghanistan okay. 2001. You can get very dramatic... Uh, effects in a short period of time. It's a, it's a policy choice. But the reason is, is because you have a ground force then that can, and it doesn't have to be the world's greatest ground force, can exploit the effects of air power. If you don't have someone to exploit the effects of air power, then it becomes very attritional and just takes a lot of time. And it, just like training takes time, an air power alone campaign uh, takes a long time generally as well. So that brings me to the question of uh, 
the use of special operations or possibly the overuse of special operations for every national security problem that this country faces. Uh, it, one could argue that this White House uses them like the ultimate Swiss army knife of the Pentagon to throw them at a problem. Do you have the numbers you need to meet the mission set you face? I, I know you're a few years out, uh, Admiral Olson, but I know it's something you still watch. And you've been watching it closely because you've needed them to either go out and protect your intelligence forces as they're collecting things or to engage. So Eric and I, uh, in our tenure, I mean, since 9-11, uh, we have doubled the size of our special operations forces. We have tripled the budget, and at the highest op tempo, it's down a little bit right now, uh, we have quadrupled the, op the operational tempo, the use of these forces since 9-11. That's dramatic growth, and it's, they're, they're plenty big. It's a question of all of them, but they're also in great demand and what you do with them. But. The, the manpower under the command of the commander of special operations constitutes about two and a half, maybe three percent of the overall uniform manpower. The definition of a special operation is an operation conducted by forces for which other forces are not organized, trained, and equipped uh, to conduct. So it's really a negative definition. It makes them utility infielders with guns. And, and so the question is not should special operations forces be bigger, because growth management, frankly, has been a, a challenge. Right. It's whether or not other forces should be organized, trained, and equipped to do some of the things that have fallen on special operations over the last few years, because special operations were sort of already there and agile and responsive. But there's no reason that other forces couldn't do much of what special operations forces have been caused to do. So just to make clear that point on growth management, the issue is maintaining the high level of quality that's in the special operation forces. That's been a challenge as we've expanded them so much. So doing a vast expansion of them only makes that challenge that much greater, which is why it's time to look at the, well, it's been a long time, to look at the regular forces to see how that mission and task mix is going between them and what training needs to be done in the regular forces. But if you look also, our intelligence community has grown by a similar amount. Um, in 2006, you know, at the height of the, um, the old Iraq war, we had six of these uh, unmanned aerial vehicle combat air patrols, Predator, or people call them drones. We have 60 some today. You know, we've increased that by a factor of 10. And so there's, there's plenty of capacity. It's just the world's a messy place. So, so while we're on that subject, do you care to give us an update on where the Defense Clandestine Service was when you left? Because there was a, a move to grow it and a briefing about how you all plan to grow it to several thousand people to do the same kind of intelligence collection but of a different nature um, than CIA overseas operatives do. Because um, there were reports that, that plan growth had been curtailed. Yeah, no, it's, it's growing. It's an important initiative in terms of uh, human intelligence is particularly important in this world against the uh, range of uh, challenges that uh, you described. And the Department of Defense and our military have something to contribute to the overall national effort. It's a partner in that effort. It's, not, uh, it's a complement. Uh, I would add it's a junior partner. It's not rivaling the size of the CIA, but it's, it's important. And we've had strong support from the CIA and the DNI in this effort, and it's about all I'm going to say about it. And but it's still growing? It's doing, it's doing good stuff. Yeah, it's still growing. OK. Um, you could give us a ballpark figure. I, I won't. OK. <laughs> so but that, that brings us to another subject, um, it, some of the tools by which special operations carries out its trade. Uh, yes, sometimes guns, but sometimes remotely piloted vehicles, drones, um, the targeting end and the rating end of special operations gets most of the headlines. Um, it also gives a policymaker in the White House a black and white resolution to a problem. There's a name that was on a list that said they were a bad person, There's, then that name is crossed off the list. Uh, therefore is targeting overused. Uh, we've had 13 years in the Middle East of some of the most sophisticated targeting this planet has ever seen, 
And yet, we've got the growth of a second militant group that has rivaled and now surpassed Al-Qaeda, according to FBI Director Comey and some of y'all. Is targeting overused? So one of the big revolutions in intelligence in the past uh, decade or so has been the operationalization of, of a certain portion of our analysts as targeters. And that has made a dramatic difference in all forms of intelligence operations. I mean, are they, uh, or, or counterterrorism operations and other operations, um, where all these operations are really intelligence driven and the analyst is really, really at the, at the center of it. Back to the strategic effects, you mentioned Al core Al Qaeda is on its heels uh, in the Pakistan um, border region. Only one of the senior leaders uh, who were there for the 9-11 attacks is left. That organization is a shadow of what it was just um, uh, five, six years ago. So it's, it's, it's been an extraordinarily effective campaign over many, many years. Uh, but but did, it, did it just push the balloon to Yemen? Because now Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has a sophisticated bomb-making machine and technology that it's training now well, there relatively was this, unchallenged. Well, there was this thing called turmoil in the Middle East that opened up some new fronts in Syria and then um, Yemen as well. But we talked about ISIL. ISIL was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. We threw the kitchen sink at Iraq. We knocked Al-Qaeda in Iraq down 90%. Uh, and they fled to wadis and they reconstituted in Syria, they're back as well. So you, you, it's not just targeters or anything else. It was the entire might of the United States for several years, and they still survived. Because, why? Because Syria. You had a civil war in Syria that, that basically gave them a new lease on life. So, and that's, that's so just you're, you're saying it's, it's, you can help fight part of the problem, but it wasn't your job to bring stability to the Middle East? Well, we, we tried, but we're still working on that one. So I, I agree with the ambassador from France that not every challenge is a nail, but there are some nails out there that need to be hammered. And, and I think that part of it is the, the tactical removal of competent leaders of ISIL from their positions. But part of it is also the psychological effect of uh, sort of reminding everyone that ISIL is not invulnerable, that, uh, that they do have uh, weaknesses that can be exploited by capable uh, opposition forces. And, and, to, and I think it damages their recruiting efforts. It damages their own shtick. Uh, to be able to reach in and with precision take out key leaders from within ISIL. Let me, let me just jump in. I, I think it's really important when we start having these conversations to remember that they, we are operating under authorities, right? These, these are authorities given in time of conflict um, that include the ability to use targeted approaches for capture, for intelligence gathering, and in some cases for targeted killing. Um, so I, I just want to start there because I do think the drone debate has become... Um, you know, unhelpful to say the least. So does it have strategic effect in that sense? Absolutely, and we have, as policymakers, we have to be mindful of that reality. Um, but if you look obviously at the progression of warfare over time, we don't raise villages. You know, we, we by and large don't strategically bomb anymore. And the fact that we have a tool set now that allows us to really reduce the number of civilian casualties, and we have really reduced the number of civilian casualties involved in a conflict, that I think is a story that's important to tell. Now, are there civilian casualties that occur? Yes. Are there questions about the transparency of the US process for targeting? Yes, and I think we need to address both of those. But I think it has been a, a good tool in the toolkit, used well, and something we should continue to look at. And then um, back to Eric's earlier point, you know, ISIL is different from Al Qaeda in that it is an army. So in that sense, it's kind of like the Taliban, you know, and it's holding territory. You need a different strategy to attack that than you do um, Al Qaeda. You could, there's common elements against the leadership, but um, but you, you got to defeat an army with an army. And yet, isn't every drone strike a potential recruiting tool, recruiting bonanza for the opposition? Well, there's that theory out there, but there's, uh, 
you know, one, I mean, we have an obligation to protect the United States of America, but, uh, um, you know, it's funny, we've done a lot of surveys in Pakistan. The closer you are to the strike, if you're uh, local, the more in favor of it you generally are. Why? Because the guys getting struck are the guys oppressing you. Uh, the more removed you are from the fight, the more you complain about your sovereignty being violated and, and, and lots of other things. But it's been a very, very effective tool. We have the support of foreign governments. We couldn't do it without the support of governments. Uh, Kathleen talked about authorities. Those authorities rest uh, uh, in, in important cases on, on the uh, consent of the host nation. So um, I, ju I just don't buy that argument. I mean, yes, is it a tough business? It is a tough business, but it's, uh, it's a very effective one. Drones, drones are an option. Um, and when you compare the option of using a drone against the option of firing artillery round, or dropping a bomb, or putting a force on the ground, um, you know, it's not that bad an option. Uh, for one thing, it can linger. It gives, it, 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 it provides the ability to be patient in the decision to strike. Uh, it can be recalled without any effect at all if that becomes the decision. So a, a drone is actually a far more uh, a, a far more disciplined way of conducting precision strikes than some others might be. You can't call back an artillery round. And Kim, I just want to say I think that what, the, what this issue also gets to very fundamentally is inform, information campaigns, which we're, you know, we're not great at. Um, okay. So when What a, would you when say a, by an information campaign? So, so when a strike occurs, you're pointing to the fact that it's a recruiting tool. Now, it's a recruiting tool whether something actually happened or not, right? Because sometimes it's, there's a factual there's been an attack, and sometimes there's something else that's happened. For instance, we used to have in Afghanistan, of course, Taliban attacks that would then be described as US drone strikes. So something happens, and then information is exploited on the other side to create recruiting. Um, and obviously, if we jump ahead now to ISIS, um, they have an incredible recruiting uh, capability in a very low-tech way. I mean, Twitter is extremely simple. You know, my children tweet. They, they are. You know, they, they are the they're sort of the... They're not talking to ISIS. They're not talking to ISIS, yes, no. They, they follow Taylor Swift. I think we're safe. Um, <laughs> but, but we in the United States, we really have, and this is back to the tool set issue. You know, this is not a challenge. CVE is not a challenge that is best met first and fundamentally by a government organization in the light of day trying to tweet out US government positions. It has to be more organic than that, and there's a big intelligence support piece to that, and it has to be regional. In this case, for ISIS, it has to come from within the region. And the best recruiting tool for these groups is success. Successful yeah. attack on the United States, True. successful conquest of territory. If you look at why people are flocking um, to ISIL, it's because they think they've established this caliphate and they're successful, and that's what you gotta defeat. That brings me to the transparency piece, um, which we, we, full disclosure, we discussed beforehand. We don't really, it turns out, agree on this one. So um, I believe that when special operations forces are used so frequently and the operations often become exposed in social media, uh, the, the raid that got um, al-Qaeda's uh, Fraj al-Libi. Uh, Abu Anas al-Libi. Abu Anas al-Libi um, and the raid that got the Benghazi ringleader, um, also in Libya. That all broke in social media. So should there be a disclosure plan for every special operation? So that, so that if it does become exposed, you can take part in that information campaign instead of what I often encounter is a, 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 a spokesman or an official saying, I got to check to see how much we can declassify, or I got to check to see what I can tell you on that. Well, that's because, you know, I mean, we live in a fairly open world, as you mentioned, the two um, raids that instantly made the media, and there are plans to be able to adapt rather rapidly to that, but there's also things we want to keep secret because we want to do these raids again. And so we don't want to tell exactly how we did it or who the forces were and put them and their families at risk or anything else. I mean, that's, so you got but, to draw but, a line. But, but that, that, that's the difference between saying this unit carried out this raid by helicopters, et cetera, et cetera, versus saying we acted. Some of the news releases we're seeing from actions out of Syria right now, for instance, the Pentagon announced 
uh, that there was a drone strike the other day, or a strike the other day, that took out the leader of the Khorasan group. Kind of takes the wind out of the sails for all the reporters who would like to get an exclusive. There it is. It's, it's a little press release. Yeah, his name was Moussa al uh, Why not um, have a plan like that for every operation? Well, I think they do. I mean, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I agree with Mike. I mean, I, I think that it's not a forward-leaning plan. It's a response to query plan, but... Right. But there's no, it's not always helpful to announce even your successes because sometimes the confusion of a success, who survived and who didn't, what might have been taken off the site and what was left on the site and the kind of operation itself, um, when revealed, can, uh, can disadvantage us. And so it's always very carefully considered what it is you say and when you say it. Just so how about instead things that um, might be useful in terms of the information war by sharing things that you know with the press? I mean, this administration has had hot periods and cold periods in terms of when it will bring groups of reporters in to give us briefings on what they're seeing. But why not release the satellite images that show, or the drone images that show the movement of Russian forces into Ukraine. Why not release that study you were talking about saying so that most Pakistanis near a strike support the strike? Well, it was public. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was done by NGOs and others. We just. I thought you were quoting a, a DOD one. No, no, no. Was, uh, I mean, there's a lot of information out there. And then we did share satellite information with Russian forces uh, in Ukraine with our European allies to you know, make the case to them. I mean, those are tools of foreign policy. We've done that throughout our history, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis, Grenada, I can think of a lot of where we've taken imagery. But we don't want to give our really high-end capabilities that will show an adversary exactly what we can do in certain cases. So you have to think about what you're going to release and, and how. But, but I don't see it happen very often. And it would be, it, it's a tool that the Pentagon has employed in the past, such as when Georgia was invaded and the press was being told one thing by the Russian side. We had intelligence agencies show us, well, here are the satellite images that we're seeing. And then we could go to commercial satellite image groups right. and, and, and get independent verification. So that, that gave me as a reporter a way to see what you all were seeing rather than just having to take it on faith. Yeah. I think we did that with Ukraine. I mean, I think we showed forces coming across the border and et cetera. And why not more with ISIS? I'll take the easy out. I mean, yeah. the Special Operations Command referred all queries to the Pentagon. And it, <laughs> it, 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 okay. it, wasn't, it wasn't up to us to decide the policy on revealing operational information. Right. And so, so we, we stayed out of that. So Maybe the White House went hot and cold, but Special Operations Command stayed pretty cold. Right. <laughs> so just a couple more questions before I open it up to the audience. Um, the New York Times had an article out recently about Navy SEALs and the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. And one of the uh, officials quoted in the article, anonymously as I recall, said that JSOC investigates JSOC. There was an, an accusation that special operations doesn't hold itself to the same accountability standards as the rest of the forces. Uh, and I can only speak from my own frustration that I would sometimes find out, I found out for instance that in an alleged strike on a wedding, an alleged drone strike that hit allegedly a wedding party in Yemen, um, I found out that General Votel had ordered an investigation into that. He'd ordered two investigations into that. Um, as a reporter trying to report to the American public, that showed me that JSOC was trying to investigate itself and be responsible. Why not publish more of this? Um. So number one, in that particular case, the investigation was actually done by CENTCOM. So I think it kind of disproves this thesis that, you know, our, our special operations forces are grading their own homework. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't give much credibility to an anonymous source. Um, and many of the other sources in that article have not served any time lately. Uh, 
and I, I can say that most of the time, almost all the time, special operations forces are a supporting force uh, for some bigger operation, certainly where there are other forces on the ground, special operations is always, almost always in support, always operating with the approval of an ambassador under the command of a geographic combatant commander. Uh, they employ other forces in almost every spe special operation. Runways have to be provided, airspace has to be cleared, logistics support has to be provided, medical support, uh, intelligence analysts, um, this is not a, 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 a cult or a secret society or a sect that operates independently. It operates with much transparency, full transparency, uh, within well, the military. Not to me. No, not to you, <laughs> but intentionally not to you. But My it operates with. It operates. <laughs> you avoided you for all those years. It operates with full transparency within the chain of command and within the structure that's provided uh, to do that. And I will say that, you know, as a as a matter of policy. A chain of command cannot investigate within its own chain. It takes an outsider to do an investigation. And so it may be within the special operations community, we may appoint an Air Force um, component uh, leader to investigate something that happens in the Navy component. Uh, but to think that that's sort of some secret cover-up kind of thing is it, th there's never, to my knowledge, been any sort of revelation of some kind of cover-up that took place within a special operations investigation. So what is their track record? Track record of? Uh, of, of investigations within the force. You, you yeah, had... I mean, there are multiple investigations. I'm speaking now historically. I don't know the, the case now. But, uh, but when I was there, there were multiple investigations underway every day, uh, looking into things that just didn't seem right to commanders or other leaders or in response to allegations that had been made in some way against the force. They're all adjudicated, and, uh, and there are many actions that are taking place. As you don't know about the investigations, you also don't know about the disciplinary actions that are taking place, sometimes to protect embarrassment of an individual or, um, or some other aspect of force capability. And, uh, and, and I think but, my own sense, it's, 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 it's all been quite yeah. well disciplined. But I don't see secrecy as necessary to protect the embarrassment of an individual who might have committed a crime or done something wrong under the military code of justice. Well, those things become a matter of record. Record, yeah. But not openly available record. A matter of military record. Yeah. yeah. If it's military justice, it is. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so last question, Iran. Uh, if the deal goes through and Iran is allowed to uh, ramp up its energy-only nuclear enterprise, will the U.S. intelligence community know if they cheat? I have high confidence in the ability of the uh, U.S. intelligence community to monitor lots of things in Iran, particularly uh, compliance. There's you know, there's always challenges with verification, but that's the structure, you know, what the, what's inherent in the structure of the deal. But uh, uh, we know a lot about Iran. One of the generals um, from Special Operations who's serving on the ground in Iraq right now at, at a conference recently in Tampa said that the head of the Quds Force inside Iraq right now um, honestly believes that the U.S. is supporting ISIS, and they, they learned this through um, intercepted communications, et cetera. Can this deal with Iran in any way foster some sort of understanding between U.S. forces and the Iraq, Iranian forces both inside Iraq, such that those kind of misunderstandings go away? I think you can. Um look with some hope to the fact that we have been able to sit down through negotiation with the Iranians in, in a, not just U.S., obviously, but also with our European uh, partners and others. Uh, you can look with some hope to improvements in understanding, but I think that's an extremely long road. The conspiracy theories in the Middle East run every which way. Um, if you were to have had that same conversation with somebody in the uh, UAE, uh, they'd probably tell you they think the U.S. and Iran have struck a deal together to divide up the Middle East. I mean, I, I, 
the reality is um, we're in for a very long period of instability in the Middle East with cross currents running every which way, and the U.S. will have to be able to talk to the parties in the region and reassure them as best they can about U.S. interests. Look, there's a lot of um, uh, conflict points between the United States and Iran that haven't changed by this deal. Uh, they're supporting Bashar al-Assad. Uh, we want his uh, removal and transition of power in Syria. They're supporting the Houthis uh, in Yemen. Uh, we're supporting uh, the Hadi uh, government in exile. Uh, uh, in Iraq, we find ourselves on different sides uh, from time to time, trying to undermine our influence. Could force uh, activities, activities everywhere. Activities. So <laughs> there's a whole range of that that's right. not going to, it's unlikely to be made whole anytime soon. Right. So uh, just one last follow up. How quickly would we know if they've cheated? Weeks, months, days? Um, well, it depends what they're doing, but um, uh, it, it, it just depends. Some could be some could be hours. Other things could be week. Uh, but you know, you, you can't just cheat like that. I mean, it's, it's and, and whole scale, large scale cheating takes some time. So some of it might literally be hours that you know, like and others, others a week, and others something else. So does the opening up, the, the warming of relations... The question is then, what do you do about it? So, so does the opening up of relations with Iran, the slight opening, mean that either the U.S. or other intelligence services could have greater visibility on what's going on? Well, I think the deal structure is to try to give us greater access, and, and yeah, access is generally a good thing, but we're not de wholly dependent on that. To be continued. So with that, I'd like to open it up to the audience, and please wait for the microphone. Over there. Yes, uh, Guy Swan from the Association of the U.S. Army. I have a, a question about sequestration. Uh, two weeks ago, we saw a, a, a large announcement by the Army coming down 40,000 troops, uh, sequestration could take that down another 30,000, and that doesn't include cuts to the Na Army National Guard and the Reserve. Um, given that our special ops forces depend so much on the conventional force and the military services for enablers, recruiting, what kind of impact is that gonna have given that we're, we're doing more with our special ops forces? Uh, well, thank you for that softball. Um, I was, uh, had the pleasure of being in Fort Hood, Texas, the day that the Army announced that there would be cuts to include in Fort Hood, Texas, so I kept my head low. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely going to have an effect on Special Operations Forces. It's going to have an effect overall. Look, the, the United States has made a decision to reduce the amount it's going to spend on defense, at least in the base budget. Um, and that's a national level decision. That's a political decision that has to do with what we spend, uh, how we tax, what we spend on our entitlements, what we spend on our domestic programs, and then of course the national security piece. So defense is the tail on the dog. And those of us who live in the defense community, it, it boggles our minds because we live in that tail, if you remember the fleas in the tail, if I keep going with the analogy. But, but, but the rest of the public does not, they're not focused on that. And unfortunately, I think the reality of the effects, whether it's the army drawdown, whether it's readiness decline, whether it's the op tempo that forces are feeling, which is going up in several key areas, um, whatever it's going to be, that's going to be lagging, unfortunately. And that's the reality we have to live with. The, the telltale signs that, the, that our military, we have underinvested in our military, will come too late to fix some of the problems, and then we'll be back in our usual mode of, of trying to catch up. We do have this relief valve, if you will, called OCO, Overseas Contingency Operations Funds. Much of SOCOM is funded through OCO. One of the things that the three of us and others worked on for the last 10 years or so is trying to migrate that into the base budget. That will not happen with sequestration, period, full stop. Um, so we will continue to live year by year for SOCOM in much of that OCO budget without an ability to plan long term. And when it comes to those threats at the high end where we're trying to do high tech 
um, build-outs, it's extremely challenging to do that in a world in which we don't know from year to year what the budget is going to look like. So just predictability, even if it's a low level of funding, just predictability will help us plan the kind of defense that we need for the nation going out for 10 years over these challenges we face. And sequestration is also particularly mindless. It cuts your most of your, your least effective program by the same amount, it cuts your most effective. I mean, it is, it's just an abdication of responsibility. So, Guy, I would, I would say it depends on how the services prioritize. Um, but, and I, I think I've used a biological analogy here before, but organisms at risk tend to shrink to protect their core. And the Special Operations Forces are not at the core of any of the big service capabilities. And so the services, when they have luxury of doing it, provide the kinds of things in their budget that special operations needs. Uh, but most of the growth within the special operations community over the last decade has not been in the core fighting forces of the special operations community. It's been logisticians, it's been intelligence analysts, it's been tactical air controllers. It's been these things that in a perfect world would be provided by the big services, but given the strain across the services for the similar capability, special operations had to grow them themselves. So, so I think what sequestration will do is put more pressure on each of the services to find room within their reduced budget to invest in the kinds of things that special operations depends on. Next question. Um, Blue Jack. Just wait for the microphone. The gentleman in the sharp jacket. Yes. Al Cannon, the sheriff of Charleston, South Carolina, and this is our summer blazer, so. Uh, <laughs> well publicized uh, communications from Al Qaeda Central to Al Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Mossad al Zarqawi, about the brutality and the impact that that had. ISIL has been exponential in that regard. What's your assessment of what I would term as sort of an impotent? sort of international response to this. Has there been anything in your mind, concrete, directed towards ISIL to emphasize or de-incentivize that kind of brutality? Um, well, we're certainly trying to de-incentivize it by killing as many of them as we can. <laughs> uh, uh, but. Um, you know, the, ISIL has got war against everybody. So the um, message that you're referring to um, really was Al-Qaeda's strategic guidance to its subsidiary in Iraq at the time. Leave the Shiites alone. You know, we'll deal with them in a future day, uh, intra-Islam fights. Right now, we're focused on the West. And he didn't pay attention to that. ISIL makes war on anybody. And, you know, it's been successful to some extent. It's also its brutality. Its brutality backfired on Zarqawi. That's what led to the Anbar awakening. And at some point, it's going to backfire on ISIL as well in the, in the Sunni lands. I mean, the, the Sunni areas of Iraq, you know, if you tried to look at it in straight military terms and say, how do 2,000 guys in vehicles defeat an army of 50,000 that we had spent $25 billion training it isn't because of strict military balance analysis. It's because of the politics, their loyalty to the state, their frustration with the central state, uh, et cetera. And that will, that will turn on ISIL at some point as well. Jennifer. Thank you. Jennifer Griffin with Fox News. I have a question for Admiral Olson. Do you see a time when women can serve in Special Operations Forces, Delta Force, Rangers, uh, Navy SEALs? And if you were still SOCOM commander, do you think you'd be asking for an exemption um, later this year? And for the panel as a whole, do you think the US created ISIS by invading Iraq in 2003? Well, uh, I'll answer the first question and let the panel get to the rest of it. <laughs> the, the, there have been female operators in the special operations community for a long time. They've gone as far forward, they've stayed as long, they've li lived under the same conditions as the men. They've served in our military information support roles, they've served in our civil affairs roles, they've performed with great distinction, sometimes quite heroically. And, 
and, and there is much more opportunity, I think, for women to serve across the special operations community. So I, I do see increased roles for women across special operations. That doesn't mean that I'm a proponent of all military occupation and all specialties being open to all women all the time. But I do think that there is much more uh, that women can do uh, in, in very important roles uh, in combat environments. And I'll, and I'll open it to the rest of the... I just, the, just wanted to follow. Um, if a woman passed BUDS and had the physical attributes to join a SEAL team, what do you think it would do to unit cohesion to have her in a team? Well, I mean, there are, there are women who, who have served as attachments to SEAL platoons and Green Beret ODAs and the Marine Corps but, but teams, very small levels. They're forward with a dozen or 15 people, and two of them might be women. And so... But that's different than everyone in that team relying on that woman to drag them out of the firefight or risking getting shot and them having to deal with her being yeah, injured. It is, it is. And, and so I think that um, if the question is what will it do to unit cohesion, I don't think that's really the right question. I think it's, it's what does it do to tactical decision making in the field, uh, which, which is a big question about how how tactical leaders will respond to being in a position to put women to take the first bullet on a target. There have been great success with women on, on targets, but, and the, the cultural support teams, which have been written about uh, some lately, um, were quite effective. But I'll just remind you that, they, that their role on target was to be women, not to be combat soldiers. And the first thing they did when they fast roped out a the first helicopter on the target was take their helmet off, let their hair down, and corral the women and children, and have a have a very important mission on the target that only they could do. And uh, and I think that sort of expanding that kind of role for women in ways that, that women can perform roles that women can perform that men can't is something that we ought to seek every opportunity but, to do. But you'd be more comfortable with that than having them in a direct combat role, going through the door first as the shooter. If you're asking me personally as an American male, um, the answer is yes, but I don't want to sound like an old white guy. I think that, uh, I, I think that we're only having part of the discussion on women in combat, and, and this wasn't supposed to be about that. Uh, but, but, but since you asked, I think that we need to ask ourselves as a society if, that, if we're willing to put women in frontline combat units to take the first bullet on target, are we willing to cause every 18-year-old girl to sign up for selective service? Are we willing to cause women to serve in infantry units against their will, as we do men? About 30% of infantry units are men who didn't volunteer to be in frontline combat. And if we're willing to order women into combat, not just let them volunteer for it, uh, then that's an entirely different discussion. If we're going to have equal opportunity, we also have to have equal obligation to serve in those very dangerous roles. And, uh, and if we are, as a society, willing to stop saying women and children first and instead say every man for himself on a sinking ship, then, then that's the kind of discussion we ought to be having. Because it does affect how we think about women in, in very dangerous roles. So, okay. so that, that, that's kind of my sense of it at this point. Yeah. And, and I'm not in a position to do anything about it, but I know the, the, the Decisions will be made here in January of 2016 regarding what roles women will have. And that last question to send us home, um, did the invasion of Iraq help create ISIS or create ISIS? Well, so create technically, no. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was formed before the invasion in 2002 uh, as Abu Musab al-Zarqawi left Afghanistan after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. and made his way into Iraq. Um, did it intensify the growth of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, ISIL's predecessor organization after 2003? You bet it did, uh, as it e expanded the Sunni insurgency. Um, and then if you move forward to um, the rise of ISIL after Al-Qaeda in Iraq was largely defeated, 
it's really a creation of um, the Syrian civil war and the sanctuary. You know, a lot of them operated uh, uh, from there uh, during the Iraq war. You know, Al Qaeda in Iraq is not just Al Qaeda jihadists. It's former Iraq military officers, uh, Sunni military officers, and others. Uh, and then, um, you know, created by, uh, or at least allowed to expand by Iraqi government actions and how they manage their state. Completely okay. agree. So, um, on that note, thank you very much, and conversation to be continued. <laughs>